This podcast contains discussions on sexual misconduct. Topics such as sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment may be discussed. Listener discretion is advised, and we encourage self-care and seeking professional support as needed. Providing assistance. The first thing is that it is based on discussion with the community and with women in the community, and including potential victims. We don't group victims together to talk about the package because that is, we breach the confidentiality, but we bring women, they may include the victims, they may include other people to discuss, have their views of the needs that they need. In this episode, I speak to Dr. Eugene Conaghy, UNFPA's Deputy Director for Humanitarian Response Division. We delve into his experience as UNFPA's representative in the Democratic Republic of Congo in 2021. The UN doesn't pay compensation. It's not about compensation. Compensation should be paid by the perpetrator. And that has gone through the court. So what we provide is assistance and the, it should be made clear that it is not about compensation. Eugene explains the nuances and the complexities surrounding organizational accountability and victim support, and finally reflects on the unique position of being a male aid worker, highlighting the chance to stand up against misconduct and champion change. There's also an opportunity to show that you are a he for she, that you stand up against that and fight, fight very strongly to ensure that we put an end to that. This is the Hashtag No Excuse podcast. We discuss the challenges, complexities, and potential solution in preventing and responding to sexual exploitation, abuse, and harassment in the humanitarian and development sectors. You'll hear interviews with victims and survivors, experts, aid workers, artists, and leaders. The podcast is produced by the World Health Organization's Department for the Prevention and Response to Sexual Misconduct. I am Guni Dias, your host and Global PRS Network Coordinator for the department. Dr. Eugene Konyoy, welcome to the Hashtag No Excuse podcast. Thank you for inviting me. It's great to have you in person for this episode. For this episode, I'd like us to zoom in your experience as UNFPA's representative in DRC, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. All right. So just for context, for those who don't know, UNFPA stands for United Nations Fund for Population Activities. UNFPA is known as United Nations Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights Agency. Is that correct? Yes. Could you provide insights into the type of data that UNFPA collects regarding sexual exploitation and abuse? With regards to data on sexual exploitation and abuse, it is important to have data about the victim, about the perpetrator, about the location, about the assistance that the victim receives. But what is even more important is to make sure that the data is confidential. So when we set up a database like we did in DRC, I supported the resident coordinator to set up the database. We ensure that we don't put the names of the victims or anything identifiable mm -hmm. of the victim or the perpetrator in the database. That is a very, very fundamental. So what type of information are we collecting? Are we, so not their name, but the nature of the act, what, what is it that we, we collect at this point? If we collect the profile, we need to know the, the, the sex of the victim, mm -hmm. the age. We need to know many things about the victim, right? About the location where the victim was found, yeah. about the perpetrator, the same age, sex, a profession, many things. But now when we are recording in a database, because that database can sometime get into somewhere where somebody can identify. Mm -hmm. We make sure that 
instead of names, they are codes. We don't put names of people or something that you can easily say, ah, this is the person who was involved mm -hmm. in a database. So that is just for to ensure that we stick into the principles of confidentiality. At what point do you collect that information? Information is collected progressively. If an allegation is made, we have information. As investigation is going on, so we have confirmed cases and cases that are still pending mm -hmm. investigation, right? So information is added as we progress. So like the same like assistance, we don't give assistance one day, we give it for a period of time. So assistance is added. But mm -hmm. the essential thing, as I said, is to make sure that such a database is so that somebody cannot easily identify. So it is, it is pretty difficult. And I can say it is quite a new area mm -hmm. because uh, there are very few countries that have a database humanitarian or development for ACA. Mm -hmm. So it's something we are still learning, I can yeah. admit. So we are still learning, but we are very keen to make sure that such a database is secure. What are some initiatives uh, or program that UNFPA has implemented to provide ongoing support to survivors or victims of sexual exploitation and abuse? What we do as the United Nations Population Fund um, is first of all about prevention and risk mitigation, right? Mm -hmm. Because when they say a new crisis, the first thing is to do the risk assessment mm -hmm. and then identify the risk and put in mitigation measures to prevent any risk, anything that can occur. But we know that it is often difficult to prevent 100%. The ideal is to prevent that we don't have a single case. Mm -hmm. So we also set in what we call community-based complaint mechanisms mm -hmm. uh, in the community so that, and sensitize the community so that they are able to uh, complain, report, notify if there is a case, right? Yeah. Uh, we put in different ways whether they are uh, there are boxes, whether there is a, a hotline and a wide pending investigation, then we have to provide assistance to victims, whether it is the medical, uh, mental health and psychosocial support, mm -hmm. whether it is socioeconomic reintegration, whether it is legal assistance, or whether it is assistance to children born out of ACA. We uh, provide that comprehensive package of assistance to victims that are victims of SEA. Now, apart from the assistance, it's also important that we ensure coordination, especially in the context of humanitarian, because the effort should be, there is need for coordination, yeah. because the impact of SEA to an organization, an actor in humanitarian setting, affects everybody. So we do, like a DRC, support the, red, uh, the, the HC and the RC in coordination. We provide staffing to support real coordination that coordinate all the efforts and ensure that we do not duplicate. We learn from each other and put together things. And things like the database we also set, and it is under the coordination system managed by the resident coordinator, humanitarian coordinator, to manage the database and ensure that it is secured and bring together all cases together in one database so that we can monitor the progress and see what we are doing, right? And uh, I think that is it. And it's all about ensuring that we reach our goal of zero tolerance and, in fact, our goal of zero case. Mm -hmm. I know people say this is impossible, but UNFPA ambition is to have no case of ACA or GBV. Zero means zero. I'd like to discuss victim assistant package. In the work we do, we try to strike a delicate balance in providing support without subjecting victims to repeated potential harm and, and abuse. Could you elaborate on the intricacies of formulating the assistant package and what are the factors to keep in mind as you do so? The assistance is tailored to the needs of the victim. The adv yeah. comparative advantage of UNFPA is that we bring in the experience providing assistance mm -hmm. to gender-based violence, 
which is very closely similar, but not the same, like that for ACA victims, right? which is a comprehensive package still made up of medical, mental health and psychological support, legal assistance, re socioeconomic reintegration, and all that. It is, it is similar package. So we draw into the experience that we have providing the package for gender-based violence, which is determined now, I will explain, uh, by a, generally by three things. Yeah. The first thing is that it is based on discussion with the community and with women in the community, and including potential victims. Yeah. We don't group victims together to talk about the package because that is, we breach the confidentiality, but we bring women, they may include the victims, they may include other people, to yeah. discuss, have their views of the needs that they need. That's the first thing. The second thing that we do to determine the package is to work with the food uh, security actors to determine the cost of the food basket. The cost of the food basket is, in most communities, determine the minimum wage. Okay. The cost of food, food basket is very critical to know how much you, you can give to the, to the, to the, to the victims. Mm -hmm. And the last thing is... We also have guidance from the global protection and GBV actors to be aware that we shouldn't give too much a GBV victim, more than what the victim has been used to before, because you are exposing the victim to harm and abuse, to more harm and abuse. So we balance this up. It is not an easy exercise, but it's done jointly by partners working in the GBV and protection sector to determine the package for GBV in each country. It is not the same globally. You can't have the same globally because the context is different. In terms of the medical, for GBV, the medical is clinical management of rape. The psychosocial and mental health support is the, is the same. You, we provide it. And then for legal assistance, is to ensure justice for the victim. Mm -hmm. So we have this package that initially, I can say a few years back, when we started really seriously responding for SEA, we decided to adopt this package for GBV to victim because, in fact, the nature of the crime is the same, right? The impact is similar. So we said, maybe this will work. So when we say GBV, we mean gender-based violence, right? Absolutely. So do you want to paint a bit the picture between GBV and the difference or the similarity between gender-based violence and sexual exploitation and abuse committed by aid workers? I think the, the main difference is the nature of the perpetrator, mm -hmm. right? The perpetrator in case of sexual exploitation and abuse is an aid worker. Right. Is a person who comes who is supposed to be providing assistance, supposed to be protecting and providing aid to somebody. Mm -hmm. Has the power over that person, then he provides it, right? But in case of gender-based violence, it is not the the aid worker. It's other people within the community. It's not not somebody who's coming, right? So that's one big difference. Mm -hmm. The other difference may be that gender-based violence is include other things far more broader. Right. Include harmful practices like female genital mutilation, include early marriage. Mm -hmm. It's included on a gender-based violence, which are not bad. So gender-based violence tend to be much more broader in yeah. scope and not just about uh, sexual exploitation. And, uh, 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 it's much more broader. So is it right to assume that the way you would assist a victim from SEA, so sexual exploitation, and GBV, so gender-based violence, would be slightly different. How has your understanding evolved uh, regarding the support provided for victims of GBV compared to SEA? I would say conceptually, mm. the support is similar, but we have learned over time that it is not the same. We need to there is to make a, a bit of changes yeah. to the package that we give for gender-based violence, right? So, but it, when we started, we, in, we look at it and say, well, this should be similar because the nature of the crime looks the same and all the like. But we have learned over time that it's not the same. Yeah. So we have learned. And uh, now 
I think a couple of countries are going on and revising their protocols and package for ACA to incorporate the lessons that we have learned over time. Could you share with us specific lessons learned or insights that led to recommendation or consideration for adapting that support package for victims? And also, I'd like to build up on, you know, the recent media attention on victim support, especially concerning instances involving cash distribution for the socioeconomic reintegration, which sometimes is misunderstood as a compensation given by the organization for the victim. What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, let me correct you and say the UN doesn't pay compensation. It's not about compensation. Compensation should be paid by the perpetrator and what has gone through the court. So what we provide is assistance, and the, it should be made clear that it is not about compensation, right? If uh, it goes through the court and the perpetrator is found guilty, it can pay compensation. What we learn about the socioeconomic reintegration, uh, which cash is part of it, yeah. because it also includes training on income generation activity, providing starter kits, providing many other things too. The aim is to make the victim uh, self-autonomous and is independent and is able to take care of herself or himself and the, the, the people around uh, him or her. Mm -hmm. So what we realize is that one, the expectation is different. The expectation of the victim the expectation of the media, the expectation of the donors, the expectation of the international community is that we need to do more. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. It's already. And this expectation, I think, is founded. It's founded. Why? Because we also realize that the victims of uh, SEA have gone through, some of them, it is not all, uh, during the period of exploitation, for example, their, their living standard change. Mm -hmm. The victim is caught in a situation where she or he has to maintain the living standard. And there is no other way than to get into a cycle of vulnerability and repeated exploitation. We are not recommending that we should consider when we are determining the package mm -hmm. of socioeconomic reintegration for victims. We have to assess and determine how that uh, exploitation and abuse has affected the way the victim was living and the impact on her. Uh, it's, it also involved seeing the way how we can link the victim to other like the, uh, the, 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 the microfinance and other saving and loan uh, association within the community but the essential thing is that we need to get the victim out of the cycle of repeated cycle of exploitation. Mm -hmm. Because we realize that once this is not done correctly, often the victim takes the money that is given for socioeconomic reintegration and then use it for, to provide for immediate family needs. We make sense because if you are the one and the family need food, you will not take money and put in some sort of business which you are not sure that is going to come and the family is hungry right. and may die. So they have to provide for the immediate family need. Yeah. We also learn from the medical care because the minimum standard for GBV, the medical package, um, I'm talking purely medical, not mental health and mm -hmm. psychological support, just medical, is about clinical management of rape. Of rape, yeah. But this, we also found that it is not sufficient uh, because the victim we need other basic medical care. It could be malaria, it could be other things, it could be pneumonia, other things that she cannot afford, he or she cannot afford. So we are now considering it is a question for the community, for the all partners working in this area to look into what are we going to do? Right. We, are, we are confronted with victims who are not able to, we just give them clinical management of rape and then leave them. There are other health issues around, basic ones that they cannot afford. What do we do? Mm. We also realize in terms of mental health and psychological support is that often 
the investigation take long. Yeah. And during the investigation, the victim has no update. And the counselor is asked several times by the victim, can you give me update on the situation of the investigation? The counselor has no information. And that has a serious impact on the mental health of the victim. The victims actually, this is the most important factor we found that is making the victim not to feel to recover easily from the, the trauma because they feel that at one point they feel that the organization is doing is not doing anything. We are just pretending because if after one year you cannot tell me where investigation is going and you keep on talking and talking, it means that he doesn't think that we are serious about it. So it is now a question. Yeah. We know that investigation is confidential. How do we inform update the victim? The follow-up, right? So it, those are questions that we don't yet have answers, but they are critical to examine, right? Of course, yeah. It's uh, the same like the services that we provide to the, uh, the children born out of SEA. The standard package that we provide is about providing school kids, school fees, providing nutritional support, and providing medical care for the children who are born out of victim. Mm -hmm. But what we realize is that there are other children in the family. We are caught in a situation where the support goes to one child in the family, mm -hmm. and the parent is confronted with some sort of discrimination between children. One child is going to school, the rest are not going. Mm, one child is eating, yeah. the rest are not eating. If you are the mom, what will you do? You won't allow discrimination between your children. You try to do something. So we are caught. What do we do with children who are in the family, yeah. but the parent cannot afford for them, and we are taking care of one child, mm -hmm. right? Another thing that we learn is about the duration uh, we also learned that the, uh, initially uh, we set up the duration of the assistant based on the global minimum standard of GBV, which is about 6 to 12 months of assistance to survivors of GBV. Mm -hmm. But we quickly realized that this was not enough. Why? Because investigation doesn't finish in 6 or, or 12 months. Yeah. So we ended assistance, but the victims have not have any information about investigation. And so it becomes a problem. So what we are recommending now is that to continue assistance until we have full investigation. Otherwise, then we stop somewhere and the victim start looking and said, well, you have abandoned us because he has no information. Yeah. Legal assistance is the same. It takes too long to get the, uh, the legal assistance because also of investigation, because if you don't finish the investigation, then if the victim wants to take the case to the court, then you don't have enough evidence to present to the court, yeah. right? So those are the, the things that we, we learn, and I think that there is still more to learn than what we have already learned. Mm. Yeah. It's a very complex uh... yeah environment, isn't it? Yeah. In your vision, what kind of institutional and cultural change would you like to see w within the humanitarian and development sector to address and prevent sexual misconduct more effectively? I think the first thing is learning from what we are doing, because if we don't learn and just keep doing, mm. we will not really get out of this problem. Right. Uh, so I believe that keeping track and documenting what we are doing and making sure that we document the lessons learned. Uh, certainly we are going to make errors, but let us not make the error twice. Right. So let's learn from the positive and negative and continue to improve. That is one. The second aspect which I think is critical is we need to bring humanitarian development together because now in some places it is believed that SCA is a humanitarian problem, and uh, development, no, is just humanitarian. It is not true. It's happening in all community, and we need to work together, collaborate, integrate our efforts together, and work together the, in that way, because humanitarian will not end SCA. 
if there's something in development. And development will not and have to collaborate, find ways to work together to end the ACA. The third is, we yeah, I think is critical, is putting the government at the driving seat. We go to a country, we start seeing ACA. Sometimes we are not talking with the government, we start seeing, identifying, doing investigation and doing everything and giving assistance and say we are going to end. Why do we think that the government has no rule? In countries, in other countries, it will not happen. The government will take it and take it to court and handle it. Right. Why do we do in humanitarian context and fragile context, we put, just put the government aside? We will not end it if the government is not taking the lead. The government has to take the lead because the government has to hold accountable and ensure that the population is protected. Because the UN has uh, very little power to, 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 to enforce justice. Mm -hmm. The government has. So strengthening the capacity, the national capacity to engine a, uh, sexual exploitation and bad abuse in government institutions, in religious institutions, the private sector, is the way to go. And it is through that way that we are going to end. Because when that happens, it is the government that will hold humanitarian accountable if something happens. Being UNFPA's representative in DRC, when this there was a surge of of cases that came out, has it ever been a challenge to be a man? Has it ever been a challenge to be a man in the field, the prevention and respond to sexual misconduct? Yeah, I think it is a challenge and an opportunity. Yeah, it's a, it's a challenge in the sense that there are only few men who tend to be victims of survivors. Mm -hmm. Majority are women and girls. So it is challenge and frustrating to see that you are a man and that most of these crimes are committed by men. Yeah. To feel really painful, right? Mm -hmm. There's also an opportunity to show that you are a he for she, that you stand up against that and fight, fight very strongly to ensure that we put an end to that. Given the challenges and complexities surrounding the, the issue of sexual exploitation and abuse, what aspects of your work make you feel hopeful? I think w one of the aspects which we have seen in the last couple of years, two years or so, has been strong collaboration. Mm -hmm. I can give an example of UNFPA working very closely with WHO, with other partners, with UNICEF, UNICEF. We build, when the case, if you take the case of um, the 10th Ebola in DRC, uh, UNFPA worked very closely with WHO mm -hmm. to build up that partnership for UNFPA to provide uh, assistance to victims. I think... That I'm very hopeful because partnership enables us to bring to the table our comparative advantages, to learn from what each other is doing, and to strategize together. Right. Right. So I'm very hopeful because of the of, of the of the partnership. I'm also very hopeful by the fact that in the last couple of years, um, many organizations, including UNFPA, has taken ACA seriously. Yeah. It's about zero tolerance. They have trying to put zero tolerance into practice and it's being practiced by UNFPA. It is zero tolerance. Mm -hmm. We don't joke with it. It is zero tolerance. And I think that that made us, make us very hopeful yeah. that things are going to change. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yuji. Thank you for listening to this episode of the World Health Organization's Hashtag No Excuse podcast. We hope we've given you another perspective on preventing and responding to sexual misconduct in the humanitarian and development sectors. We release new episodes every two weeks. But if you have any feedback, questions or suggestions in the meantime, feel free to reach out at prseah at who.int. Until the next time, goodbye.